Hey, thanks for tuning in to Cross Defense. Today on the show, we're talking about eisegesis, exegesis, Chrysostom, and, well, of course, the theater, as you see from the title. We're talking about how going to the theater is sinful. What does that mean for watching Netflix? All of that and more coming up right now on Cross Defense. Hello, my friends. Welcome to Cross Defense, the show where we aim to equip the mind, excite the imagination, and comfort the soul, all with God's Word. I'm your host, Reverend Tyrell Bramwell, pastor of St. Mark Lutheran Church out here in Ferndale, California, where God's people are truly unashamed of the gospel. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Thank you for tuning in. If you have any questions or comments, show suggestions, or anything you'd like to share with us, go ahead and drop me a line at stmarksferndale.com slash contact. That's S-T-M-A-R-K-S ferndale.com slash contact. That's what Ben did, and this is what Ben said. Regarding your recent note and episode regarding the false dichotomy of love versus judgment, I couldn't help but think of a passage from Ezekiel 3 that I'm sure you're familiar with. Thank you for contending earnestly for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Would there were more of you. Son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore hear the word at my mouth, and give them warning from me. When I say unto the wicked, Thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning, nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life. The same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand, your hand. Yet if thou warn the wicked, and he turn not from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. Again, when a righteous man doth turn from his righteousness and commit iniquity, and I lay a stumbling block before him, He shall die, because thou hast not given him warning. He shall die in his sin, and his righteousness, which he hath done, shall not be remembered. But his blood will I require at thine hand. Nevertheless, if thou warn the righteous man, that the righteous man sin not, and he doth not sin, he shall surely live, because he is warned. Also, Thou hast delivered thy soul. So warn your neighbors, and if they listen to you, they will live, and you will have preserved your soul. Not warn them, not speak God's warning out of love to your neighbor, and not only will your neighbor die in his sin, but you will be culpable. Thanks. Thanks, Ben. Yes, that's a great passage from Ezekiel. And thanks for giving us the older translation. That was fun to read. I appreciate it. (laughs) Christ be with you, my friend. That's stmarksferndale.com forward slash contact. If you'd like to reach out, you can send any kind of message you'd like. And uh, if it's pertinent to the show, we will read it on air and we'll definitely uh, read them all as they come our way. So today we're talking about Walther's 10 arguments regarding why Christians shouldn't watch Netflix. I I, I mean, (laughs) go to the theater. But first, a few notes to help prepare us for such a hard word to receive. It truly is a hard word. So let's start with something a little closer to our time. Walther wrote his 10 arguments in 1888. Neil Postman was critiquing how we were amusing ourselves to death in his volume with that title, Amusing Ourselves to Death, in 1984. So 100 years later and much closer to our own day. And Neil Postman explains the value of reading the works of dead men. You might say, well, why do I care what Walter has to say about going to the theater? He's so outdated. He has nothing to say to me about watching Netflix and movies and streaming services and all this. Uh, but, uh, he actually does. And obviously, you know this, Christian or else you wouldn't read the ancient scriptures. (laughs) When did uh, Ezekiel write what Ben just quoted in his email to us, right? Yes. So we understand that that argument holds no water. But just to be clear, let's hear how Postman puts it. This is quite the quote. Like the fish who survive a toxic river, 
and the boatmen who sail on that river, there still dwell among us those whose sense of things is largely influenced by older, clearer waters. So where does our clearer sense of things come from? Well, ultimately, from the older, clearer waters of Scripture. Yeah? Yeah. And from our connection to Scripture by being able to read it ourselves, but also through those men who've come before us and handed down the traditions of the apostles to us, traditioned us. That's what the word tradition means, to hand down. Who've handed down these writings for us from a time of older and clearer waters all the way down to our very toxic river. C.S. Lewis said, it's a good rule. After reading a new book, never to allow yourself another one until you have read an old one in between. Mm. Good wisdom from these boatmen from older and clearer waters. But why is that? Well, to use the familiar saying, because we are in constant danger of not seeing the forest because of the trees. We're too close to the subject at hand. Or, to riff on Postman's analogy, all we know is our new current toxic river. The old guys bring us older and clearer, fresher waters. And they are a relief to our souls because of it. It is a wonderful thing. Now, Postman himself, as we read him today, since he died in 2003, has become one of these dead men whose words come to our toxic tributary like a boatman from older, clearer waters, even though his boat travels from the recent past, not the far distant past like, uh, past, like Walther in 1888. It's paramount that we call upon these men for today's conversation because what we're going to talk about, this idea of of sinning by going to the theater, sinning by watching movies, TV shows, it is going to uh, hit us hard. It has become such an intrinsic part of our identity, watching TV, movies, Hollywood. It's bound to strike every single one of you as absurd as it struck me. I all but guarantee, my friends, that you will find yourself making apologies and arguments against what I'm going to bring to your attention today. And that's only if you don't decide to label me and Walther as legalistic Pharisees and just cast aside the next hour. Intriguing stuff, right? So, the sin of attending the theater... That is to say, imbibing in movies and TV shows, our, our saturated Hollywood culture, inter entertainment culture. This is a hard thing to wrestle against if we take the time to actually do it. It's easier to keep our head in the sand and just pretend like it's all innocent and neutral. Yeah, some movies are awful because they're rated R or something like this. Uh, but no, I think you understand already, my friends, as we're starting to see the entertainment industry for its demonic true self with the wokeness going on and how Disney, of all things, is now pushing critical race theory, LGBTQ this, and uh, feminist that, all that stuff, right? We see it all. And we're all starting to go, I'm not sure I want my little kids taking this in. Well... That's the beginning of seeing the problem. I would push that the rest of the problem is taking it in at all. Theater, we shall see, was thought of before the rise of our Hollywood age. So before the 20th century, theater was saw as a dangerous thing by most of the Christian church. So we all have our own presuppositions right? And this is what we're getting at with the older, clearer waters. It helps us get past or through our own presuppositions. That's why reading these old dead guys is helpful because we see the trees. They're able to take us to a place where we can stand back on the precipice, look out at that vista and see the entire forest. 
So writing in 1888, that's what Walther is going to do for us today. Because he did write before the dawn of our entertainment epistemology. And he didn't mince words denouncing the attendance of theater, the theater, as sinful. So, do you have the wherewithal to stick with me, my friend? Can you hang with me on this show? I know it's uncomfortable. This is a great opportunity to exercise objectivity in our day of subjectivity. To check our biases at the door and practice guarding against eisegesis. What's eisegesis? Good question. Very good question. Eisegesis is when the reader imposes his or her presuppositions his or her own biases, onto the Bible. When we read into the text, making it say what we want it to say. Now, we all have our presuppositions, as I already said, but it's inappropriate to let those presuppositions color the words of the text. It's true for the Bible. It's also true for that text message you got from your friend yesterday. Your friend wrote the words. They're his words. It's not our place to interpret them according to our view, but rather we are to read them as his words. Eisegesis is precisely why text messaging and social media conversations tend to break down quickly. Each person is sitting in his his separate place, his own location, at his own home, or in his own car, wherever, but he's disconnected from the other person that he's messaging. And he's reading his or her biases into the words on the screen. You don't want to read into anyone's words, and you especially don't want to read into God's word. That's inappropriate. That's bad. Here's an example. If you listened to last episode, the last episode of the show, you recall that I read from Reverend Eckstein's chapter in Ethics of Sex. And in that chapter, he did a great job of presenting the words of Bible scholars who, though they affirm homosexuality, they don't read their presuppositions into what Paul wrote to the Romans, the Corinthians, to Pastor Timothy, But they stop at reading what they wanted to say, reading into that. They stop and they let the text say what it's saying. They let Paul say what it's saying. They let God's word say what it says. And for that, there's much respect. They don't engage in eisegesis. If only the false teachers in my neck of the woods would follow suit we would all be in a much better place here at St. Mark. In the ongoing saga between Christ and the world out here in Humboldt County, California, our, our, our local Episcopalian priest, one of them, confessed to employing eisegesis, though I will admit I don't think he realized he was making that confession. So this is from Eureka's Time Standard newspaper online, The Reverend Dr. Daniel DeForest London writes, I grew up convinced that homosexuality was a sin, according to the Bible. That's what he says. And this is, my friends, the biblical understanding of homosexuality, as we explored in the last episode, and you've probably uh, explored in many different times in your own reading and Bible studies at your own churches. This is held by the Orthodox Church. It's been held that homosexuality is a sin throughout all of human history. But then something happens to Reverend Dr. Daniel DeForest London. He continues, When I began working as a chaplain and urban minister in San Francisco, I quickly learned how much pain this conviction, the conviction that he grew up with, that homosexuality was a sin according to the Bible, how much pain this conviction brought upon the people to whom I felt called to minister particularly AIDS patients. Although I know the quote-unquote truth, scare quotes, can sometimes hurt, I felt deeply troubled by the fact 
that my ministry seemed to be pouring salt onto other people's wounds. That's what he says. Okay, so, so what happened? What are we hearing here? Well, he had a personal experience, didn't he? He continues, this disturbing experience compelled me to research more thoroughly what the Bible really says about the subject. Ah, Reverend London, speaking for himself, not reading into his words, says he held that homosexuality was a sin while growing up, according to the Bible, and until he was a chaplain and urban minister in San Francisco. He, he held that view until he started doing ministry. He felt bad for the AIDS patients that he was ministering to. Enter the eisegesis. He continues, After years of prayerful study of the Bible, in its historical and linguistic context, it became clear to me that although the Bible certainly condemns sexual abuse, pedophilia, adultery, and prostitution, the Bible remains very unclear regarding the subject of homosexual behavior between two consenting adults. End quote. Interestingly enough, the historical and linguistic study of Scripture apparently didn't happen, if we're reading this in a simple way, until after this chaplain, this urban minister, was moved by his personal experience with AIDS patients. So what did Reverend London tell us? Without reading anything into his words, he told us that he had one view of the Bible before he encountered AIDS patients that prompted him to revisit the Bible for years, he said, of prayerful study, and then it became clear. Then it became clear that the very people he felt his ministry had hurt were not sinners any longer. He no longer had to be party to pouring salt in their wounds, to use his words. So the fair question is, for this minister, why did it take you so long to come to that conclusion? Why did it come after your seminary experience? After you were already a minister in the urban ministry? after you were already a chaplain. See, homosexuality is not new. Scripture has been around for millennia. And the Orthodox Church, small o, has all throughout history taught that homosexuality is a sin. That's always been the position. The truth of the matter is that it takes time for the devil and our own sinful desires to wear down our conscience, to where there are no more hard edges to rub against. So our conscience doesn't prick us, stick us, make us uncomfortable. But after years of working at it, we can convince ourselves that the Bible says whatever we want it to. Even that, sin is not a sin. Tragically, this false teacher is spreading the result of his eisegesis, not only with his hearers at Christ Episcopal, Episcopal Church in Eureka, but with the readership of the Time Standard, and so spreading this filth throughout Humboldt County. Let's take a break right there. When we come back, we'll kind of start moving toward Walther's 10 arguments against attending the theater. All right, we'll be right back. You're listening to Cross Defense. Now on Thy Strong Word, the Pastoral Epistles, written by the Apostle Paul and inspired by the Holy Spirit, these writings offer a glimpse into the early Christian church and its leaders. Yet these are not relics, but living letters through which God continues to guide pastors and congregations today. I'm Pastor Phil Boo, your host. Join me and a different guest pastor each episode as we dive into 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus. Only on Thy Strong Word, weekdays at 11 a.m. on KFUO. So false teachers are no bueno, my friends, no bueno. Eisegesis is no bueno as well. As 1st Timothy 4.16 tells us, Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching, the doctrine. 
persist in this. For by so doing, you will save both yourself and your hearers. So take a look at this from an eisegetical or uh, you know, on the topic of eisegesis uh, sort of perspective here. Keep a watch on yourself, guy, and on the doctrine. Don't let yourself enter into the doctrine. Let the doctrine shape you. This is what Paul will tell us. We are not to be uh, conforming to the world, but be transformed by the word, right? We're to let the doctrine read into us, change us. We are not to read into the doctrine and make it say what we want. We are not to transform it. We are to let it transform us. What we want to do, my friends, there's a language for this, there's a word for this. What we want to do is to read out of the text what the author of the words put into it. And this is called exegesis. Ex meaning out of. It's the way every faithful Christian approaches the Bible, or should. If you're not, repent and do it now, <laughs> from now on. Letting it communicate on its own terms that which it is saying. The Bible tells us what it's saying. We don't read into it what we want it to say. This is called exegesis. It's the appropriate way of reading the Bible. So, my fellow exegetes, let's now start moving forward towards C.F.W. Walther's 10 Biblical Arguments Against Attending the Theater. These 10 arguments come as the conclusion of a 15-part serial in the Lutheran Witness that ran from January 21st to October 21st, 1888. The series is called Lectures Against the Theater. I recently put out a video, a Ferndale Fortitude video called, Sure, Drag is Theater. And you can find the link to the show in the show notes. So that video in the show notes. And in this video, I quote the major thinkers of Western philosophy, Plato, Aristotle, Seneca. These men that Walther references in the beginning installments of this series. So today I want to discuss these 10 biblical arguments with a decided aim at honestly asking whether we as Christians have been overcome by the world's acceptance of theater as we, like our worldly counterparts, consume just as many movies and shows as they do. Have we been conformed to the world or are we being transformed by Christ by the Holy Spirit, by the Word of God, through the means of grace. To help you put your presuppositions aside, it may be further helpful to state what should be obvious. In case it's not, there was a time, relatively recently, before our modern entertainment culture existed. Truly, I know it's hard to believe. There was a time not that long ago before our children walked around with little movie theaters in their pockets. You see, we act like cinema is a given, that it's always been there. That's a natural part of the world, but it's not. Obviously, it's not. It's an historical part of the world. And this distinction Having to note this distinction is an indicator that our movie culture has reached mythological status in our collective memory. We have mythologized our entertainment industry, our entertainment culture, converting the historical advent of mass distributed theater through cinema into the simple, natural order of things. The adverse reaction that you're going to have on this topic, or you already have on this topic, is part of the demythologizing process of starting to see that theater is not something that has to be part and parcel to who we are. It doesn't have to be this way. We have the ability to turn off the phone the tablet, the computer, the TV, and to stop letting the thespians, 
Those who lie for fun on stage, on screen, stop letting them influence our hearts, our minds, our children, our culture. We have that ability if we can own it, if we want to. Not saying we want to. Maybe we don't want to. But we do at least have the ability to recognize there was a time before Hollyweird. I fully accept that by bringing this up, I am, to employ an ironic metaphor, <laughs> unplugging you from the Matrix. I do so with full awareness that it's extremely uncomfortable. So before we get to the 10 arguments, as I try to hold your attention till the end of the episode, let's look at Walther's introduction. He quotes several church fathers, and I think you'll find this bit of history quite fascinating. I did. What do we say in the ceremony that goes with the sacrament of holy baptism? And what, what do we say again in the rite of confirmation? Page 268 or 272 in the Lutheran service book gives us these words. The pastor asks the candidate or the confirmand, do you renounce the devil? Yes, I renounce him. Do you renounce all his works? Yes, I renounce them. Do you renounce all his ways? Yes, I renounce them. Well, listen to what Walther hands down to us from of old, those old clearer waters. Help it dilute our toxic river. The theater has, Walther says, not been condemned by highly moral heathen only, Plato, Aristotle, the like, but also by all divinely zealous Christian clergymen at all times from the days of the apostles to the present day. And that would be 1888. Maybe it ended then. When did we stop actually condemning theater? That might be the beginning of the problem. And it probably is running parallel with the emergence of our Hollywood culture. Walther, in the second century, it grew customary that one wishing to be received into the Christian church by baptism was obliged, besides saying and professing the Holy Apostolic Creed, to pronounce a certain formula of renunciation. This formula consisted of the following words, I renounce thee, Satan, and all thy works, and all thy pomp. Where we say ways, they used to say pomp. The ancient church father Tertullian living in the second century, tells us that by this pomp or pompous show of the devil, mainly the plays were meant. Since the devil certainly exhibited the greatest pomp, the most gorgeous show, the most brilliant splendor just in the plays, when he was intent on wresting a poor sinner out of the kingdom of Christ and drawing him into his dark domain. Mm. So where we say in our Lutheran service book, where we still have this as part of the rite of, of confirmation and, and the holy sacrament of baptism, where we ask the, the baptizee, those who wish to be baptized, and then those who wish to be confirmed, where we ask them, do you renounce the devil? Yes. Do you renounce his works? Yes. Do you renounce his ways? Yes. They used to say, do you renounce his pomp? As in they are the same, that his ways his splendid show, his, well, what does John 8, 44 say? What are the devil's ways? His lies. You are of your father, the devil, we read, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Mm, there it is. His ways are lying ways. And what does that have to do with the pomp and show of the theater? Well, as Thespis says, it is lying for fun. Walther continues, hence in the third century, Cyprian, Bishop of Carthage, Africa, who died a martyr several years after that, wrote to his brother Eucratius after an actor had been received into the Christian church. You ask me 
what I think of the actor among you who continues instructing others in the infamous art he has learned, and whether he might remain in the community of the church any longer. To me, it seems wholly incompatible with the majesty of God and the precepts of the gospel to permit the church to be defiled with anything like this. The law forbids men to wear women's garments. Deuteronomy 22.5 But how much worse is it not to put on women's garments only, but also to give expression to unseemly manners and so instruct others therein? Thereby the young men learn nothing good. Moreover, they are thoroughly spoiled. By the way, Walther adds, there is not a church father who was not most vehemently opposed to the attendance of the theater. Augustine, Lactantius, Ambrose, and many others cannot find sufficient words to prove how infamous a thing the play is. Since it would fill too much space to adduce, as a Proof for my assertion, a, a great number of testimonies, I shall merely impart to you a passage of a sermon delivered A.D. 387, Walther says, by the renowned Chrysostom at Antioch, where he was then pastor. The same Antioch, where the disciples of Christ were first called Christians. Acts 11.26 Later on, he was made archbishop, this Chrysostom, and patriarch of Constantinople. He is considered the greatest Christian orator of the first ages. In this sermon, he addressed his Christian hearers, saying, I believe that many of those who left our services yesterday, hurrying to the plays of iniquity, are present today. I wish I knew who they were, that I might exclude them from our holy community. Not with a view to having them remain excluded always, but in order to receive them again, after they would become penitent. Some, perhaps, will ask what abominable vice they were guilty of, because they should be excluded from the communion of the church. Why are you going to exclude them from communion? I answer, may any crime be greater than the vice of those who, having become complete adulterers, press eagerly forward to this holy table like mad dogs, wholly devoid of shame. Now, Walther's commentary makes clear what's going on here in Chrysostom's sermon. If you have any questions, he says. So Chrysostom is shocked at thinking that a man should appear at the Lord's table to receive the Holy Eucharist today, who had been in the theater yesterday. Then Walther quotes Chrysostom's sermon again. If you would know the nature of their adultery, so you want to know what their, the details of their adultery, I shall quote to you the words of him who one day will judge the whole life of man. He's talking about Jesus. He says, Whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. My friends, how many of us how many of us today, dear listeners, take Matthew 5.28 that seriously? Honestly, I'm asking honestly. The entire entertainment industry would implode upon itself if we truly believed Jesus' words that lustful eyes make us adulterers. If we truly believed that. Why? Because every Christian would turn off his TV, cancel his streaming services, and stop funding that industry. The whole thing, all of it, we have to recognize, is built on causing lustful desires. Down to the most simplest choice of picking a beautiful woman to be a news anchor or you know, a handsome man to, to sell a shampoo or something. That's all... It's all lustful eye stuff. Why? Why do we have a hashtag no filter when we talk about Instagram and things like this? Because we're caught up on, on the eye, perception, and, and causing people, moving them emotionally to do things based on what they perceive on stage, 
on the camera, on the screen. There either aren't that many Christians today, or we just aren't taking seriously our faith. Not as seriously as they did in 1888 when Walther wrote this admonition to the church to avoid the theater. Now, graciously, and also because I know of my own contradictory position, since I do watch television, and I'm right there with everybody else, graciously, I offer that the latter is the problem. But there are Christians. I'm a Christian. I know you're a Christian, too, listening to this show. That's why you're listening. Or, or you're curious about Christianity. And yet we don't turn off our televisions. We are sinners. And push it further. Let's push it further with an encouragement for all of us. Why don't we do this? Hold each other accountable. Encourage one another with the word of God. Hebrews 10, 25 style. Come together. Stop living our lives through the people we see on the screens, the fake people, the actors portraying people who we wish we could be like or, or know or this sort of thing. Stop that and actually encourage one another by gathering together around God's word and being in a community and living the life of the saints of old. Rather than recessing back into our own little worlds and watching fake lives carried out on the screen, feeling camaraderie with this actor's character or that actor's character, letting our hearts be moved by, well, thespian lies. That's all the stage is, right? It's all lying for fun. Can you lie for fun? Well, we're going to talk more about that on this show when we get back from this next break. We are moving toward our 10 arguments to stay away from the theater, that is to not watch TV, or to at least as we come into Lent, getting ready for Lent, maybe give it up for a season, see what it might do to our lives if we had a change of pace, reclaimed our hearts and minds from the screens. So I, am, I do want to encourage you to uh, push a little bit more to reclaim and guard the heritage of our people, Christians. That's our people. Those are our people, Christians. And that heritage has been handed down to us, traditioned to us from the apostles, from Christ, and from all of God's people from the days of old, among the prophets, Moses, all of them. Let's take a break. We'll be right back, and we'll finally get to Walther's 10 Arguments Against the Theater. Iron sharpens iron, and one man sharpens another. Put this wisdom of God into practice by listening to Sharper Iron on KFUO. I'm your host, Pastor Timothy Apple, and faithful pastors from around the world help sharpen my faith in Christ every episode. I know you'll be blessed by listening and studying God's Word with us. Listen to Sharper Iron weekdays at 8 a.m. on KFUO and on demand at KFUO.org, the KFUO radio app, and anywhere you get your podcasts. I know, hard words. I warned you. I told you at the beginning of the show they were going to be hard words today. We were all going to have to repent of this. We certainly are. We have to own our sin. This is what we, we do as Lutherans. We know this. We don't deny sin. We don't put our head in the sand and pretend like we're not engaged in it. We, we confront our sin. We call it a sin. We own it. We repent of it. And we ask for forgiveness with contrite hearts that don't want to do it again. Do we approach the theater that way? Do we approach Netflix that way? Or since it's happening in the privacies of our own homes and on our own screens, do we pretend like it's not so bad and imbibe in that sinfulness in our own hearts? Well, and since we're all doing it, are we really, are we really that bad? Is this how we approach the theater? Yes, I think it is. So Walther continues after Chrysostom's uh, sermon. He says, nobody surely will be so bold as to assert that he had listened to and looked at everything in the theater, on the stage, with pleasure, whilst no evil thought entered his mind. Now, how true is that of the entertainment industry today that we ingest? The movies, the shows we watch. 
Are, can you truly say, are you truly as bold as to assert that you can listen and watch TV with pleasure, enjoying it, well, with no evil thought coming into your mind because of the thing you're watching? I don't think so. <laughs> I can't. So without fur any further delay, let's get to Walther's 10 arguments from Scripture, which ought especially to frighten a Christian from attending the theater. Those are his words. <laughs> That's how he introduces it when he finally gets to it here on October 7th, 1888. 10 arguments from Scripture, which ought especially to frighten a Christian from attending the theater. And I would add, as we've already been discussing, watching television. So first, the Word of God says, Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Romans 14, 23. Hence, according to Scripture, those works merely are good and pleasing to God that proceed from faith, and all those not emanating from faith are bad works, displeasing to God. And just those works of the unbelieving that shine most and are most admired by the world are but shining vices, as has been justly remarked, St. Augustine, the church father. Now in a play, a wrong virtue had a wrong vice, and a wrong vice are represented. Good and bad works are judged erroneously. The shining works of the unbelieving, shining in the eyes of reason, are extolled highly in the play as most noble deeds, though they are nothing but the fruit of haughtiness, pride, and selfishness. On the other hand, the works of the most pious Christians are represented either as products of ignorance or as products of enthusiasm or as products of hypocrisy. The greatest vices are there represented as virtues or they are extenu extenuated and excused as being quite pardonable matters. And so his conclusion here from Romans 14.23 Whoever, therefore, goes to the theater goes to the school of unbelief. And isn't this exactly what's going on? How many of the shows you watch today are pushing the pride agenda, the LGBTQ? How many are infusing into the story political agendas, trying to convince, trying to portray the Christian heritage as violent and vile, full of all kinds of error while presenting the non-believing, unbelieving culture as the wholesome, good, true one. Paganism is elevated and Christianity is denounced in the theater on your screen. Second, the Word of God says, flee fornication, but adultery fornication and unchastity is represented in the plays as something that might be overlooked easily perhaps as something quite natural even, yea, as the most amiable gallantry. Why, generally, all features of the plays finally aim at serving the lust of the flesh only. And so the conclusion of this second argument coming to us from, from God's word tells us to flee fornication. By attending the theater, one consequently goes to the school of of voluptuousness. Okay. And so now the third argument that ought to frighten a Christian from watching Netflix. <laughs> the word of God says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith. 1 Peter 5, 8 and 9. According to Holy Writ, therefore, a Christian ought to be absorbed by nothing, but his soul should be vigilant and sober. But the design of all plays is to deprive a Christian of all vigilance and soberness. They, one and all, aim at flustering, spiritually intoxicating, yes, bewitching him. The gay-colored adornment of the theater, the splendid illumination, the garments of the actors and actresses, partly pompous, partly unchaste, the song exciting all the nerves, the music drowning all voices of conscience, the continued change of interesting scenes devouring every other thought, all this already is serviceable to this purpose and aims at affecting the looker-on, so that he will not, as it were, 
know himself any more. The pictures there presented to his eyes are of such a nature as to make an impression on him that will be ineffaceable. He steps out of the theater, but the pictures presented to him follow him and still fit about his soul. Asleep and awake, he sees what he saw. One going to the theater nearly every day is forever living in a world of dreams. He can no longer reconcile himself to reality, thus growing unfit for his earthly calling and his life. And so the conclusion. Whoever attends the theater enters a magic circle where he may finally be easily deprived of his Christianity and thereby of his salvation. Walther's fourth argument from Scripture against the attendance of the theater is 1 John 2, 15 and 16, where we read, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of the life is not of the Father, but is of the world. But the playhouses are most eminently the temple of the world in which it worships its three-headed idol, lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, and pride of life, sacrificing body and soul. Conclusion then, therefore. From 1 John 2, 15-16, whoever goes to a playhouse or turns on his TV screen consequently goes to the church of the world. But still more, fifth, God's word says, Ephesians 5, 4, filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, let it not be once named among you, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. In the plays, however, especially in comedies, filthiness, foolish talking, and filthy or at least unchaste jesting constitute the principal part. For the world does not wish to cry over sins, but to laugh at them. You, however, that are Christians, do not say, Oh, we shall be very careful not to laugh then. First, you do not know whether you will not laugh when you see them all laughing, just as Peter, having once stepped into the house of the blasphemers of Christ and been seized with fear of them, finally uttered blasphemes himself. And second, Christian reader, listener to Cross Defense, are you not ashamed to go to a place where all kinds of shameful words enter your ear and soil your souls? Oh, leave it hurriedly and weep bitterly with Peter. Whoever goes to the theater, therefore, goes to the school of shame. Sixth, Scripture says, pray without ceasing. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 Praying, however, is altogether out of the question in the playhouse. True, they sometimes pray there, too. Even a miserable prostitute and courtesan will often pray there with her whorish lips. It even happens that holy baptism and holy Eucharist are mocked on the stage. Besides that, the name of God is taken in vain in the theater. They swear frivolously and curse by all that's holy. And Christian reader, you will pay these cursing players for their cursing? Whosoever goes to the theater goes to the school of scoffers. Interesting point there. Will you pay these scoffers to scoff? Right? Will you pay the actors, these cursers, to curse? Will we continue to support those who mock our God? Mm, that's a convicting one, right? Seventh, Scripture says, Be not conformed to this world, Romans 12, 2. Theatrical plays are, however, most properly to be counted among the pleasures of the world. For the church of the New Testament did not get the play from the church of the Old Covenant, which did not know anything of it, but from heathendom. Whoever therefore goes to the theater or goes to the school of the world, makes it his teacher, becomes a declared apostate, and above that, perhaps without wishing to do so, yea, protesting against such an imputation, thereby actually pronounce publicly, I will not belong to the Christians, but to the world. I do not wish to be a world-denying child of God, but a child of the world. Eighth argument. Scripture says, sit not in the seat of the scornful, Psalm 1.1. But how may one attending the theater deny his seating himself with the scornful? Where will they sit if they do not sit there? Hence, it is out of question. 
Whoever goes to the theater does not merely seat himself aside, but even at the feet of scoffers. The ninth argument, Scripture says, be not partakers of other men's sins. 1 Timothy 5, 22. It is impossible, however, to go to the theater without partaking of other men's sins, both of the sins of the players, the actors, and of the audience. For what are you doing by going there? The fact of your appearance in the theater calls upon the actor to sin, to do something on account of which he has ever been excommunicated from the true Christian church. The other godless attendants at the theater, however, who come for the purpose of catering to their flesh, you are confirming them too. And still, you mean to say, I dare go to the theater without committing a sin. Oh, may God keep you from this dangerous delusion. Your own sin draws you into the theater, and fraught with many of other people's sins, you go out again. Think about this. The Grammys just made you know, all the news headlines for the uh, that performance of Unholy by whoever those people are. I don't even know my music industry. Uh, but they were dancing around, transgender people dancing around in BDSM stuff and looking like hell and fire and flames and the devil and all this kind of stuff. That's at the Grammys. That There it was on full display. But do you know just from the common sense and everything else you've picked up, how evil... How many sins are caught up in the Hollywood industry, the movie industry, the entertainment industry? We are constantly funding this and contributing to our neighbor's sin. Not just the neighbor who's watching the, the bad movies with, with sinful stuff on full display, but the entire industry. I have encouraged my own children into this in the most simple, honest ways that we would have thought were not a problem, but they are. They are a problem, aren't they? We've got to be more careful with this. Now, sure, we don't want the law to beat us up and crush us. The devil's going to use these words I'm saying to, to make you feel worthless and, and small and crush you and say, see, Jesus doesn't want you. You're so vile. You've been watching movies your whole life. Oh, Pastor Bramwell said you're wretched. No, tell the devil, take a hike. We repent of our sin and we plot our course from our toxic river back to the clearer waters of truth. That's the plan. And so our tenth argument, we read in God's word, teach us to number our days, that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Psalm 90, verse 12. Hence, according to Holy Writ, a pious Christian is forever to think of his death. But the actor is bent above all on causing people to forget, for some hours at least, that they must die once and appear at the judgment of God. Whoever therefore goes to the theater goes to the school of atheists, whose principal motto is, Let us eat and drink and be merry, for tomorrow, perhaps, we shall be dead, and death ends everything. Now then, dear reader, Walther says, I would ask you, what will you do? Will you side with Christ, or will you side with the world? Will you be an attendant at church or at the theater? Perhaps you will say, I will attend both. Let me then point out to you, says Walter, the word of the prophet Elijah in 1 Kings 18.21. How long shall you go between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. Yea, let me draw your attention to the word spoken to us all in the gospel by the Lord himself. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Matthew 6, 24. You cannot serve Christ and the world. Do not therefore, Walter says, divide your heart, but give all your life and soul to Jesus. Do you still hesitate in accepting what heaven offers you? Oh, turn your eyes wholly to its everlasting treasures and glory. Whoever does not wholly give himself up to Jesus must endure pain and anguish in this world, and his wages will be death 
eternal. May the good God keep us from this for Jesus' sake and grant us admission to yon heavenly exhibition where, after having closed our eyes in death, we will see God face to face in everlasting joy and blessed light of heaven. So says Walther. In 1888, a boatman coming to us from older and clearer waters. May these clearer waters help you dilute the toxic river that you find yourself in, along with me. We're floating in it together, bobbing up and down, taking it into our lungs, soaked in it. For this reason, we remember our baptism. How can we not when we're talking about floating in a toxic river? Because in our baptism, we were baptized into Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus took all of the toxicity, all the filth from our day and age, from ourselves, our souls, upon himself. For he died for you, Christian. He died for you to make you his and to rescue you from this toxic river. Christ be with you. You've been listening to Cross De- Cross Defense. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for hanging out with me this past hour. And we will continue the conversation next week. Cross Defense is a production of KFUO Radio. Find past episodes and support Cross Defense at kfuo.org.